Amen. All right, then. Well, you may be seated. We'll be in John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Uh, and in John chapter 6, this is a very long, long chapter, you know, 70 uh, some odd verses. Uh, and uh, so we're not going to finish it all tonight, you know. It's, uh, but I do think if you can uh, have been following us along in John, uh, you're going to see John once again go back to a particular analogy that he gives to try to explain um, a spiritual truth. You know, the last time we saw this was uh, when Jesus met the woman at the well. Yeah. And, uh, and, and even though the issue was about her going there to get water, by the time Jesus finally got her to understand the spiritual truth, it was about living water and not natural water. So here tonight, we're going to see a couple of things that lead to that same uh, analogy, but this time it's going to be around food, you know, and so therefore this is where the uh, chapter where Jesus feed uh, the uh, 5,000, and as a result of that, he take that example of feeding them natural food and turned it into a spiritual uh, thing, referring to him as the bread of life. And so, and, and that's what this point is going to try to, to get them to see during this particular chapter, is that they got to make that connection that he is more than just spiritual food. And, and at the end, toward the end, it looks like Jesus get a little frustrated with them because it seemed like they were only following him for what he could do for them in the natural. And so uh, we won't get that tonight, but I may just kind of preview a little bit. It depends on where we stop. So what we see here in uh, verse 1, <clears throat> it says, After this, Jesus crossed over too far to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, uh, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. In other words, that was the Roman emperor uh, who would, that sea was renamed in honor of, but we still, most of the time in the Bible, refer to it as the Sea of Galilee. And uh, it, it was a pretty large uh, body of water, probably 13 miles by 7 miles, they say, and about 150 feet deep. So, uh, so uh, they were on a particular side and, and where Jesus had prepared the 5,000. And so now they were on their way to the other side. And they're going to end up on this other side. And there are going to be some things that we see from that. And so the Bible says in verse 2, a huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. You know, and, 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 and again, the frustration that Jesus is going to have is that now he sensed that he have followers, but everybody that's following him is not following him to learn the truth of what he's trying to teach and what he's trying to get across. A lot of them were following him for what they could get or have their needs met. And so there was this huge crowd. Jesus was continues to be, he continues to be popular. And because of that popularity and the signs and things he's done, you know, people follow him. Then the Bible says, then Jesus climbed the hill and sat down with his disciples around him. And it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. I think most of all got a good idea of what Passover is all about, kind of connects to how we re uh, connect Resurrection Sunday about that time uh, where the Jews celebrate the exodus of Egypt. And so it was about that time, so, so uh, uh, an important time in the religious world. And now... Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked. Now, he was asking Philip this question we're going to see here testing. Where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Now, now, the Bible lets us know next that Jesus asked Philip a question that he knew the answer could not be met with what they had. And, and, and so forth. So he asked Philip this in a means the Bible says in order to test him. So look at verse 6. It says, He was testing Philip, for he already knew. That's key. Before he asked the question, he already knew what he was going to do. But he was asking Philip to test him, test him to see how he was going to respond. And now you got to keep in mind, now, if it's 5,000 people, you know, Philip looking in the natural. Jesus said, hey, go get us some bread so we can feed these folks. Philip said, man, I live around here. 
This is a territory that I grew up in, and I know in my mind there's not enough places around here to go and get that much bread. And on top of that, we ain't got enough money. We don't have the resources in our treasure to cover that. Now look at this. He says, he was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we work for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Now, so, so Philip looking at things naturally and thinking that, hey, what Jesus was trying to get across was just a natural part of feeding them. And he's saying, hey, the natural solution to give them the bread that they need, we don't have. Okay, now while that conversation was going on, verse 8 says, then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Now look what he says. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Now, he said that, but he wasn't thinking that what he said was even possible. I done found this little boy with a lunch, but I'm looking at it in the natural, and what good is this little lunch going to do when you got 5,000 people? And that was what most of us would say. I don't want to make it look like, you know, we would be any different from, from Andrew because we'll look at that and say, you know, especially if we don't believe that Jesus can do what he said he can do. Especially if we got a problem in our natural mind saying, man, I, I know two loaves and five fish and two loaves, whatever. Man, that's just enough to feed my family. And I'm looking out here and seeing all these people. So he said that with skepticism because he's thinking, that, hey, it ain't going to happen. Now look at this. Go ahead, Brother Her. Couldn't this mean the same situation when God took uh, Israel from Israel from what, from uh, from Egypt and then went into the desert? And the same thing that uh, God provided food for for Israel. And I'm saying this is almost the same situation where, once again, that God that Jesus is able to, to feed the people uh, in the same situation. I, I'm just saying is that, you know, God can provide. And, and that's given to another example to who he is. Just like his father was able to feed Israel when they entered the desert, Jesus is able to do the same. He had to have the same power to be able to do that. In, in, in a sense. Amen. Well, you know, later on in the story, that truth is going to be revealed because uh, Jesus is going to use that example in the wilderness to kind of upset them, though, her. They gonna, they, the way he gives that analogy, they're going to give credit to Moses, and Jesus is going to come back and say, you know, you guys lifted up Moses, but it wasn't Moses who did that. It, it was my daddy. It was my father who did it. And so he, he addressed that in, in, in that exact scenario uh, here at, uh, in a couple, in some verses later, okay? So in verse 10, he says, now look what Jesus said. Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone were 5,000. So some people said they had their wives and children there. It could have easily been over 10,000 people right there at that one scene. Then in verse 11 said, Jesus, then Jesus took the loaves, gave Thanks to God. Now that's important. You know, anytime we want God's blessing on something, man, we got to invite him to the situation. I mean, we, when we do things, we ought to pray to God and ask him for the outcomes that we're looking for. So what Jesus did, he says, now, he took the loaves and gave thanks to God. Well, now, we ought to look at that as no different than, you know, if God done blessed us with something, then we ought to give thanks for what we already have. You know, that's why we, have, we sit down and have a meal. And we sit down, we ought to give thanks. As if God is blessing us with what we're about to receive. Because we believe that the earth is the Lord. 
and the fullness there are, and everything that dwell therein. So he, he gave thanks to God and distributed to the people. Afterward, he did the same thing with the fish. And look at this. They all ate as much as they wanted. Some of you Bible say they ate till they got full off that little boy's lunch. All of those people ate. Now, that was a, 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 a monumental miracle right there. We saw Jesus use this principle of multiplication. He multiplied what was given to him, and as a result of that, he was able to feed all the people. But I like what it says. They ate as much as they wanted. They, they took what looked like was not enough, like it was lack, and then they ate like it was more than enough. You know, they, they all ate as much as they wanted. And look what verse 12 says. After everyone was full, meaning that nobody was cut off. So however this miracle was taking place, it was like, Major, every time someone came back for more, that was more there for them. And so now this miracle of multiplication, the Bible don't tell us exactly how the fish was all spread out and the bread spread. It just said that hey, he told them to distribute it, and everybody ate until they got full. And after they all ate, you know, there was some leftovers. Because Jesus says, now look, now gather, this is verse 12, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. Wow. Pastor, that's a miracle. He, absolutely. Because he has uh, some sardines and a pack of crackers, and they got leftovers, 12 baskets full of leftovers. And uh, I remember the day that I'd go ahead and eat a tin of sardines and crackers, and there wasn't but crumbs left. And you just back that stuff up. <laughs> because I'm keeping it in mind, this is a young boy. This ain't a, a grown man, this is a young boy. So you're not going to feed him something that he's going to waste. So when you think of a small fish, it may be something like a brim or something like this here, but it's not going to be that big because think about how our parents raised us because don't let your eyes get too big in your stomach. You put it on your plate, you're going to eat it. So I'm keeping that in mind as well because this is a miracle. We, we think of it like this boy done drug up a 1,000-pound a tuna. No, it was a little sack lunch. Amen. And they had 12 baskets left. Amen. Good point. Good point about that, brother. I mean, uh, Fred, I'm sorry. That, that goes to show us, you know, that that 10% that God asks us for, as long as we keep in our hands, it's just 10%. When we put it in his hands, he'll multiply that, or we'll have more. Okay. I, I, I'm following you there. And so, so what we got to look at this, I look at this uh, kind of like resources that you have. And what Jesus did, he took what he had, the resource that he had, and he used it to the best of his ability. And so a lot of time, we look at our resources, and in our mind, because it's not enough, we want more before we start using what we already got. And so what we got to get out of this is that when God give you a resource, if you got something, you got enough to start with. You got enough to say, God, I'm going to start this because you gave me a resource to get started, and I'm going to believe if I need more, once I give thanks for what you gave me, then when I need more, somewhere it's coming up. It's going to show up. But that's what faith is all about. Faith says, hey, take the resources God has given you. Trust that he can give you more, and you step out with what he's given you. Most of the time we operate, we would have liked to see the buffet line set up. First, then we can start. You, you want us to go out there and start asking folks to come eat, and we ain't got for this little bit. See, but faith said, "Hey, he said it's gonna happen. He already prayed about it. We know he's able. So therefore, we just need to walk in obedience to what he said. And as a result of that, like Fred said, you know, once they got through, and and, and, and Brother Anthony was saying, man, they had leftovers. And the Bible says here, in verse thirteen says." So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. Some say the 12 would represent the 12 tribes. That don't, the, you know, that's just people's speculation. It don't matter the symbolism there. The fact is, is that nobody would have expected there would have been leftovers. I think most people would have just been glad to feed them. You know, we got them fed, man. We weren't even expecting no leftovers. 
we, we was thinking scarcely. We just barely got enough to feed them. And now for those who was probably with him, they said, man, that made that miracle that much more significant when they thinking not only did he feed them, but we got leftovers. You know, I, 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 you know, we was coming up, you know, we still, some of y'all don't deal with leftovers. You know, because, you know, leftovers, you know, you, you know, we, we had to eat fresh every day. You know, when I was coming up, man, you know, Sunday, you knew you were going to see Sunday meals again. You, you know, somewhere by Monday or Tuesday, you were going to see what you had on Sunday again. And, and, and we was coming up, you know, we were, as kids, we didn't appreciate leftovers. We used to complain about leftovers. We wanted something fresh every day. But what we got to understand, as long as your needs are getting met, if God want to meet your need with leftovers, don't curse your blessing. And so sometimes what these people saw was that, hey, they had enough left over. Now, don't tell us exactly what he did with the, did they hold them for another time or whatever? That's not important. The point is, is that the miracle was done in the witness, under the witness of all these people. And when they finished, you know, they had 12 baskets of scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. Now look at this, verse 14. It says, when the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. Now, they saw the miracle. They were familiar with Old Testament prophecy in Deuteronomy that was talking about someone who was going to come and be able to be the, a prophet for them. So they had an expectation, but their expectation was somewhat wrong. He says, because what happened was, if it had been on point, Jesus would have stayed with them. They knew what the scripture said, but their interpretation or understanding of the scripture was not right. Because based upon how he perceived they saw it, the Bible said he got from around them. Now, if they had received him like he should have been received, I don't believe he would have separated himself from them. But look what he says. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be there, they interpreted that scripture that, hey, this prophet that is coming is going to have enough power to not only be our prophet, but we're going to make him our king. And, and, and the reason they wanted to do that is because they was under Roman rulership. And so therefore, in the back of their mind, based upon their nationalistic thinking, they were thinking, we need somebody to come and deliver us from these Romans. And they was looking for his kingdom and his kingship to be something in the political arena when his kingdom was, he was standing was spiritual. And so because of that, the Bible said when he saw that they was ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. So Jesus had to, after he did this miracle, he had to separate himself from them. Now, what happened here is that now Jesus gets separated from his disciples. He goes up into the hill. While he's there, they decide that, hey, they don't know where he's at. They decide they was going to head and leave and go to the other side, to the other side of the lake over to, toward Capernaum. And now during that time, Jesus, now we're going to see him doing another miracle. So he just fed the 5,000 plus. Now the disciples decide they're going to hop in a boat and go to the other side of the lake. Now, they are out, and the Bible going to make it clear, it wasn't like they were just a, a couple hundred yards in front of him. Because the Bible said when he came, they were already quite a distance out into the lake. And now this is where we see Jesus walking on water. Now, the winds get rough because this lake, like I told you, uh, uh, the Sea of Galilee was kind of, below sea level, and because of that, winds used to come through that area all the time, and it caused the water to be rough. And so these men now, the disciples are going across, look at this, verse 16 says, that evening Jesus' disciple went down to the shore to wait for him. But as darkness fell, 
and Jesus still hadn't come back, they got into the boat and headed across the lake toward Capernaum. Soon a gale or strong wind swept down upon them, and they grew, and, and the sea grew very rough. Now, we're going to see most of these disciples were, were skilled fishermen. So they probably had been in rough waters before. You know, they were in a storm once before, but in that storm, Jesus was on the boat, boat with them. He was just asleep. But on, in this one, he was not with them when they was going through the storm. And I know sometimes we use storm analogies as, as how things play out in life. And, and what we got to understand that wherever we go, whenever we go through a storm, that no matter what we think, we got to always understand in our mind and in, in, in reality that Jesus is with us in the storm. Even, even Fred, if we don't see him, even it looked like, man, we've been in this thing for a long time and we done got so much of distance between us, we got to still believe that even in the midst of the storm, whether he's, we feel like he's right there in the boat with us but just sleeping on the job, of whether we are here in the middle of the sea by ourselves, and now he got to come to us in another way. And so what we're going to see here is that when Jesus come to his disciples, this time he got to walk on the water. Now look at this. It says this. In verse 19, they had rowed three or four miles. So I told you, they weren't close to the shore. He's still on shore. They had rowed three or four miles when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. They were terrified. But he called out to them, do not be afraid. Here I am. Now, different opinions about why they were terrified. Some think they were terrified because they may have thought he was a ghost walking on the water because they had never seen nobody probably walk on water. They'd never seen that. And so therefore they're thinking, how can he, it even possible, it's, it's possible. Some think they was terrified because of the weather. But I believe it was the latter because, like I said before, they were fishermen. They probably had not been in a storm before, but now all of a sudden, sudden they're seeing something that they have never seen before. And because of this miraculous act that Jesus was doing right before their eyes, you know, they were terrified. But he had to tell them, do not be afraid. Calm them down. I am here. And then look at this. Then they were eager to let him in the boat. And immediately they arrived at their destination. Any comments? Any, any comments, Fred? Can, can, can you imagine, Pastor, you, you out here on the water, and all of a sudden, something you ain't never seen before, walking toward the boat? I mean, who wouldn't be afraid? Hey, Amen. I mean, that's the time to really call on the Lord. You know, I mean, there's got to be a, a, a sight that you had never seen before, and somebody walking on the water, you had never heard of that before. Amen. Amen. Um, uh, something miraculous they had never seen before. And, and, and what happens is now, even after seeing that, you're going to find out that all of them still not going to believe wholeheartedly. Get a mic, maybe, so the people online can hear what you're saying. I'm sorry. It was like, so after they invited Jesus into the boat, and then it said after they had been out in the rough seas, after he, Jesus got in the boat, it said they arrived at their destination immediately. Like, as soon as he got in the boat, it was like, all of a sudden, the boat got a motor on it. <laughs> no, I, I mean, cause it, said, it said they arrived immediately. They Amen. had been out in the sea just struggling and fighting with the storm. That's a good catch, Jesus major. got in the boat. They got there immediately. Immediately, immediately. they arrived at the other, the other side, at the, their destination. In other words, again, a good point is that if the seas calmed down, they was no longer mean resistance. And so therefore, they can make better time if the seas don't quiet down, and they can get, make more time and get there quicker than they would have been. 
Because if they had left that time and they was only three to five miles out, that means they was meeting a lot of resistance. And then now when he get on the boat, good pickup. They get there immediately. Pastor, you know, also, I know this is how they talk about the different Gospels, because John doesn't find it important to say that Peter got out the boat in this text. Mm -hmm. But everybody's writing to different people. And it's just like Major said, you know, the thing about, we, we're in areas where we see a hurricane, and it just doesn't calm down. Even after the, it's, it's the made landfall, three or four days later, the, rough, the gulf is still rough. So it's hard for even us to fathom about seeing something like this. The water just all of a sudden, you see 10, 15 foot waves, then it just calm, glad. Amen. Brother Her? I'm just amazing myself um, being one of the disciples on that boat. Um, I, was lost, I was lost all time seeing an individual walk on water and get into my boat. I don't think I'd be focusing too much on the other side. I still but still trying to phantom myself that this man walked on water. My focus will not be so much on the other side of, or the shore, if you understand what I'm saying. I still be trying to phantom how this how this man walked on water. And what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say, I still be amazed about still thinking about that. Amen. I, I, I still will be thinking about that. And sometimes you lose track of time. Uh, and such that for me, that I will lose all track of time just thinking this man just walked on water. So, and that's when he said immediately, oh, so, oh, we're on the other side, but I still be thinking about this man walked on water. That's what I, Amen. 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 Yes, ma'am. Get a mic, please, if we got one close by you. Uh, make sure it's on. No, I don't think so. Just leave them on, you know. Good evening. Yes, thank um, you. I, when, when you're speaking of the storm, it... It just reminded me, I, I know we're talking about a physical storm, but it reminded me of the storms that we go through in life because we, and, and this is what Jesus wants us to relate this to, to, to me. Um, I mean, if, if, we, if he can walk on water, and, and, and I believe the Bible to be true, so that if I'm going through a storm um, and, and knowing he can walk on water, it, that's telling me that he's going to be able to be there. I mean, if he can walk on water, he can calm down the little thing that I'm going through. I mean, we, we call it little thing now once we pass it, but um, it, it's like that I heard the brother over there saying it's like that, that like a tidal wave to us at that moment or, or something like that. But what, what really helped me in the, in the storm and, and peace, and I can tell you about a bond, you know, 30 something years of being saved, a lot of us have been, when, when, when we can just gird ourselves up and, and, and ask the Lord, what you trying to show me? in this trial, in this storm. And the minute I ask him to show me what he's trying to show me, it's like I heard Major say, it's like he get on the boat with me. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and, it, and it make it, it, it don't make the storm go away, but it help me ease so I don't have to go take a pill or take a drink or, or, or get so bent out of shape because I know he's on that boat with me and he's gonna see me to the end. It's just that it's, it's, it may not be immediately, but I know he's there. But, but in the midst of it, I know he's going to show me. If he allowed it to come to me, he's going he gonna to show me what I need to learn in it. And so that's what, what the way I view a storm and, and truth. Amen. Well, you know, you may make a good point if, if we're going to kind of use an analogy uh, of how we see a storm in life and, and, the, and the beauty of the fact that even though they left before him and they was three or five miles in front of him, and the, when the storm got to the point where they were fearful, for whatever reason, or fearful of seeing him, whatever, the point is, you said he got to them. And so the thing that we got to see from that is that no matter where we are in our storm, if we don't, he can get to us. And when he get to us, Fred, the storm should start to quiet down. 
And, and, and that's what we got to look at it when, when we think about Jesus and his ability to be a common effect in our lives. He said, you know, we're going to have storms. Trials come to everybody. In this life, it rains on the just and the unjust. But what we have, the hope is that even in the midst of that, he's with us or he can get to us in time. And so what we see here is that after that, they arrive at their destination. And so now what happens is, is the next day, the, the next day now, his disciples and him got separated, but now they are back together again. So the next day, that, that crowd, you got to keep in mind, that crowd got their knees met the day before. They belly growled. They won't know where, where did our meal ticket go <laughs> for the next day. <laughs> because he had met a natural need. And so now, because they are searching for him, he's going to take that natural thing and try to get them to understand something spiritual. And, and you know, sometimes it's good when we can take a natural experience and then see a spiritual connection to it. But sometimes we focus so much on the natural that we miss what the Lord is trying to show us in the spirit. Because sometimes our natural mind have to be reshaped and have to be, have to be reset so that we stop seeing things like we've always seen it in the natural. Because now when God starts dealing with us, some things can be supernatural. Amen. Don't make sense to us. Jesus walking on water. So now look at this. It says, I'm in verse 22. He says, the next day the crowd that has stayed, so on, stayed on the far shore saw that the disciples had taken the only boat. And they realized Jesus had not gone with them. So they didn't see Jesus and disciples leave at the same time. Then what they said, several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread and the people had eaten. Verse 24. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went across to Capernaum to look for him. They found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? We saw the disciples leave in the boat. When we came down, wasn't no boats left. Boats came in. Now we want to know, teacher, when did you get here? How, how, did, how did you? Now that question start off nice because now that opens a door for Jesus to minister to them. But that, the conversation takes another direction. Man, they start off like, man, rabbi, you know. How did you get here? When did you get here? Now look what Jesus said to them. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you. Now even if they just <laughs> said that by rabbi, and you know, ask him about the other side, Jesus saw right through him, man. He saw, he saw right through him. He said, look here, you want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understand the miraculous side. You didn't get it when I took two fish, five loaves, and fed all y'all. You missed the meaning of that. But because you, your physical need was met, now your physical need arose the next day, and you following me, not because you got an understanding of what happened yesterday. You following me because now you need another, you need another meal. So you know, Jesus saw right through him. He says, but don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. In other words, I have the authority in the earth to ensure 
uh, uh, afford people who come to me the opportunity to experience eternal life. And I want to be the bread of life to you, but you're coming to me for something that's only going to keep you for one day. No different than the woman that do well. You know, give me this water so that I never have to come back here again. She was thinking that, man, I don't have to come back to this well because I hate it. He's going to give me some water that's going to keep me from coming back. She missed the point, too. And so these people here missed this the, the, the message in the miracle, they missed it. They should have saw that, just like the disciples sit and walk on water, they should have, something should have cracked in their mind, Fred, to say, I saw this dude take two fish, five little feet, almost 10,000 people. That should have override their hunger, man. That thing should have excited them so much, they wanted to know, should have wanted to know, how did you do that? Make us understand the truth behind what you did. But they missed that all because they were thinking naturally. And sometimes we miss what God is trying to speak to us through his word when we read it because we're so often thinking in the natural instead of believing that God can speak to us spiritually. And we got a spirit with, that has been placed in us that if we study this word, meditate on it, our spirit will start to understand God in a deeper way. Start understanding. Because the Bible said the Spirit is a teacher. So he not only teaches us, but he reveals things to us. And that's why sometimes I tell people, you got to read some scriptures over again. Because as you grow and as you mature, when you go back and read it again, you'll see things in, your, in the Spirit that you didn't see the first time you read it. And, and, and the more you do that, the more you understand just how God does things. And so that's what Jesus wanted to do. He said, look, you guys should have been more concerned that I can do more for you than just give you something to meet a physical need. Look at this. He, let me read 27 again. He says, but don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy. We don't, you know, that's what I, I had to stop right there, Major. I don't believe the church now today spend a lot of energy on the thing that's of the Lord. We put a lot of energy in a whole lot of things that ain't got nothing to do with the Lord. They ain't bad things. They're just things. And all I'm saying, sometimes we got to say, man, can, what would my life be like if I gave God the same energy, put forth the same effort that I do that with, and I do it now I'm doing this for the Lord. And I believe when we put forth that energy seeking him and wanting to understand him more, man, I believe he revealed. Because the Bible says if we seek him, we can find him. And so he don't want to withhold anything from us, but at the same time, we got to put some energy into this relationship Amen. that we have with God. It's not something that we just sit back and then just think everything just going to happen we got to put some energy into it. He says, now look, spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. In other words, he stamped me, put his seal on me, made sure you know you're supposed to get out of this. I'm his son. I can work miracles like he can work miracles. And so therefore, if he sent me to save you, then I can be the bread of life that you need in order for you to live eternally. But if you don't get that, then now you're coming to me only because you're hungry. Brother Fred? Pastor, isn't that kind of like what a lot of people are doing today, the prosperity ministry thing? You know, I serve God because if I do this, I'm going to get this from it. You know, that prosperity stuff that they preach all the time. That's where they're putting their energy into it. People listen to it saying, well, yeah, I do it because this is going to be my reward. And I know, you know, Fred, there's a you know, controversy out there about the prosperity gospel. You know, part of that message got some value to it, I think. Now, not the whole doctrine now. Because I do prosper in the Bible. Prosperity in the word prosper in the Bible normally translates to being successful. But what has happened is we have connected success to money. 
And so God is saying, you know, he, you know, he told him, if you want to be prosperous, told Joshua, if you do these things, meditate on this word day and night, you know, and study it and all these things. He said, look, if you do, do these things, you will be prosperous and you will have good success. And so what happens is, is that today when people overemphasize the money aspects of it, then now we measure our success based upon how much money we got. And so therefore, if I'm in a gospel that talks about prosperity as being the money factor, then I got to look like I'm prosperous by letting you know how much money I got. And then now, if you are searching for just the money and you see me got the money, then whatever I tell you will be gospel to you. If you don't know the word. Because what you're trying to do, you're trying to get what I got. And I know you're trying to get what I got. And so therefore, I can say Major, I sense Major, Fred, her, they're looking for what I got. So what I need to do is tell them I got here because I, I sold my way there. Whether I did that or not. So now I got Major sitting on the edge of his seat wanting to know how much I need to sow, Pastor. If, if all it takes is me sowing, how much do I need to sow? So now I'm going to greet the preacher. You know, everybody, I mean, everybody ought to have a thousand dollar seed. Pastor Bowden just needs a seed faith offering. Seed faith offering. Just trust God with it. And if one or two people buy into that and start finding a thousand dollars, other people are going to be compelled just by being in audio. So when, when tricks like that are used to push that, I have a problem with it. But I don't have a problem with a man of God being successful at what he does and God done blessed his ministry and all that. But I'm saying this, that he got to realize that that comes on the back of the people that's in that ministry. Don't lose sight of where the blessing come from and God, God using those people to do that. And it shouldn't be used to pull more out of them by flaunting your stuff in front of them. You know. And, 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 and so... Yeah, that gospel is out there still being preached. Now, I don't see it as much because I don't watch a lot of Christian channels all the time now like I used to. So I don't know if it's that popular on the Christian channels now like it used to be. But, you know, you couldn't go to bed at night, man, without somebody talking about prosperity. Everybody's that connected thing to money and people want to be blessed and they want the soul to be blessed. And so they thought they can give their way to a blessing when 99% when of the time your blessing is connected to your obedience. If you obey God, he'll bless you. He'll bless you with what you need. And so what, what I, I don't, again, I say this again, be clear, don't have a problem with people being prosperous, being successful. No different than with people in the, in the natural, in their jobs. If you're doing a job right now, I want you to be successful in your job. You know, if you got an opportunity to, to advance and do all that, be successful. I don't think God going to hate on you for that. But if the only thing that motivates you is money, then it's a possibility, it's easy for money to become your God. And you'll get to the point where you'll, you'll sell your soul for the money. You know, I tell people all the time, and I've heard it said, you know, money is a poor master, but it's a good slave. See, if, if you know how to use it right, it can work for you. But if you are a slave to it, you'll do anything for it, to get it. And so that's messages out there, still out there. I don't see it as often as it used to, but there's going to always be a, a few people that's going to buy into that and believe that God wants them to be prosperous. I agree with that. I believe God wants us to be successful. I'm not saying I believe God wants all of us to be millionaires. And so I tell people all the time, when you sit in a church and everybody's going to think you make you, you're going to be a millionaire and it's a 200 of y'all in there, that ain't going to happen. Amen. The economy that we live in ain't going to let all y'all be millionaires. Amen. The way it's set up, you got to have people in the middle income and the lower income. They're going to always keep somebody there. So when you go to church and thinking that, okay, yeah, I want to get to the top of that, and you'll follow anything trying to get there, not realize. Now, I'm not saying you got to be the bottom, but somebody's going to be down there. You're just afraid of God that ain't going to be you. 
But some, some, somebody. <laughs> Amen. And that's just, a, that's just a system in the society that we live in. And so if you get caught up in that aspect of it, then now you'll lose sight of God. And then now money will become your God. Brother Her. You know, you know, speaking of the witness of the scripture, that's what with um, my book title and, and this little episode that you, you're speaking and Jesus talking to. And the thing is, is that you know, what I look and hear with providing to me is that when Jesus is stating his case for who he is, and this is what John is, is stating that uh, he's been a witness of Jesus Christ is the, is the, son, of, is the son of God. And he's giving you all what he had witnessed when Jesus encountered with the people. And, and one of the things that I thinking, what I received is that Jesus' message is pretty much the kingdom. The kingdom of God is, is at hand. And to get them there, he has to present himself spiritually in a sense that it's, it's a spiritual kingdom and he has to get the people to understand and not to look on the material things but look into the spiritual things and to, to draw them to think of the spiritual thing a spiritual kingdom where he's trying to draw all his people to the spiritual kingdom and start looking on the worldly and the material things and and so what I see right here is when people in this little scene saying they're having a hard time understanding like you're saying, it's the material things that they can see. But Jesus trying to uh, present himself to let him know that it's, this is a spiritual thing and I'm trying to let you know that I'm here having God in me that John is witnessing saying that he is the son of God. And so it's, it's, it's a spiritual thing that what I'm trying to say is a new kingdom. And everybody looking like, uh, if you're looking at the scriptures, it was saying that he's going to be, a, uh, uh, what is it, uh, uh, a descendant from David. So they're looking for a king like David. But Jesus says it's not, it's not like that. It's a, it's a spiritual kingdom. And I'm going to be the king. Amen. Amen. And so he has to be uh, in the sense of stating who he is and to get the people to understand that. And so that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. And, 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 and again, I think as we read on, uh, he brings that, that point into focus. Again, going back to when they was trying to put him in a position of a king, he got away from him. Now this conversation carries on. And now he's still trying to get them to see that he is this bread that they're looking for. Pastor, can yeah. I say something here before we get into that? Uh-huh. Um, we're about to talk about Moses, but way back in Deuteronomy chapter 9, God already talked through Moses to talk to the people of Israel. So these people should have known about this. We're about to take you into the promised land. But when you get there, it's going to be a land flowing of milk and honey, and it's going to be cities and vineyards, and it's going to be something that you don't even have to work for. But he gives them a warning that when you get there and you start doing well, don't forget about me because I'm the one who brought you in here. And don't remember, remember that I'm the one who gave you the ability to get the wealth that you have. Mm -hmm. So you can go ahead and take over, Pastor Carl. We're going to okay. talk about Moses in a minute. Yeah, yeah we come right upon Moses. <laughs> we better get, get right into that here, here shortly. He's saying, now, after Jesus talked about being the seal of proof, they replied, we want to perform, look what they say, we want to perform good works too. What do we have to do? Still, they missed it. Just like most of the Jews missed it. They always thought that their works had something to do with their salvation. And we understand that we don't work to be saved. Salvation is a gift that has already been purchased for us. Just a matter of us taking the gift or receiving the gift. 
And so therefore, we work because we are saved, but not to get saved. And so they're saying, hey, we don't see what you did now. And now they want to know, we want to perform God's work. Two, and then it says, what do we need to do? And they probably thought Jesus was going to say, well, you know, you got to go over there and build a house here. You got to go over there and do that. And then you can be saved too. But his answer is not what they were looking for. Because it was so simple, but yet so profound. Told them something simple. Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants you to do, to want from you. Believe in the one he has sent. It's simple, man. So now he says, now look, all you got to do is believe in the one he has sent. Right then, they were supposed to get a revelation, Brother Herb, that we're talking to the one he has sent. We saw him do the miracle yesterday. He is the one that has been sent. That was too easy for some of them. And sometimes I think people think that we got to do something great to be saved when Jesus makes it so simple. All God wants you to do, Major, is believe in the one he has sent. Believe in him. Accept him as your Lord and Savior. And then after you believe in him, your works will take care of themselves. But, but don't think that I can go out and do a lot of good works and then now I don't have a true faith in the one he sent. Everything starts with Jesus. We got to see him for who he is as our Lord and our Savior. And therefore we have to accept him in accord with God's plan of salvation. And then after that, we can start looking at what are the works that I can do now that I'm saved. And so the Jews thought that they could do works. They thought they could do these deeds. And if I had all these deeds done, but if I don't believe in the one that he sent, those deeds are not going to do me any good. Because salvation comes through him, not the work. Now look at this. They answer, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. Now you know if I was Jesus right then, man, I'd say, y'all get out of my face. Y'all better get out. Y'all better get out of here, man. The miraculous sign. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn you into dust right here, right now. I mean, I, I done fed all the folk yesterday. Y'all done figured out that I done walked on water to get over here. And then now you asking me for a, a miraculous sign. If I want you to believe. Now, you, you know, I can imagine Jesus a little frustrated right there. I mean, you, you know, I done did all this. They, they just don't get it. He said, now look what they said. What can you do? Then now they bring their ancestors to somebody to talk about Moses into the picture. After all, our ancestors Moses, our ancestor, our ancestor ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scripture says Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. They still thinking about the natural. Yes, sir. And, 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 and now they don't act like Moses is the one that provided all for them and forgot that it was God who provided it. Moses was just an instrument that God was using. Amen. And so now, look what he tells them because now he says, look, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. And I guarantee you right then they missed that. I'm offering you me. They probably looking around. Where's the loaves at? You know, because they're in the natural. They, they, I'm offering you the true bread. They're looking for things in the natural and Jesus trying to get them to see, just like he had to deal with the woman at the well, to finally get her to see that the living water was not something natural, but it was spirit. He says, verse 33, the true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven 
and gives life to the world. Wow, so Jesus clearly telling them right now, revealing to them that he is the true bread. He is the bread of life. You know, John is the book where Jesus often com compared to as the bread of life, the light of the world, the water. You know, John compared Jesus to a lot of things that we can relate to naturally. And so now he said, now Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And I am the bread that comes down from heaven to give life to the world. And look what they said in verse 34. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Now look at this. Again, they think about we get hungry every day. <laughs> give us that bread every, every day. And Jesus tried to let them know, man, I didn't come to really meet your natural needs. My primary job is to meet your spiritual needs. But now you want, you're like the woman at the well. You want this bread every day. Then Jesus make it clear. He says, I am, Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Just like he told the woman, come to me, you will never thirst. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So he tied both of those things together because now we've been reading John, we ought to make that connection when he identified that aspect of his ministry with the woman at the well. So if you got me, you won't have to worry about hungering or you don't have to worry about thirsting because you got enough. But look what Jesus said. But you haven't believed in me even though you have seen me. Wow. That's serious right there. To tell some people, man, you saw what I did. You seen me. And I'm standing right here before you. And you still don't believe. Now, Later on, we're going to find out, man, some of these people was classified as followers. They weren't just, you know, they weren't, the, it, there was more than the 12. You know, we often think we hear the followers of Christ, we think about the 12, and then he went out and got the 70 that he sent out. But he had some followers, people who, who pretend that, hey, we're in this thing for the long haul. We're following you. We're a disciple. That's why they were called disciples. We are, we are a follower of yours. And we're going to see here, we may not get there today, but some of these very followers going to listen to the teaching that he gives them and they're going to walk away. Say so they follow him no more. As long as he was meeting their physical needs, I'm on board. You got to give me some bread every day. But, but now if you start talking about some of this other stuff you want me to do, sacrifices, suffering, you know, taking up my cross, well, we ain't sign up for that. Brother Herb, I thought I saw your hand. Well, I'm just, just thinking uh, the tasking, uh, what, what we are called to do. And, you know, we kind of somewhat laughing to a point how simple the information that we see in right now that, that we are believers uh, of what John has, has been written, given us, what Jesus has been spoken and presenting himself to these people. But what's the tasking for us in a sense of being a believers also about the gospel? You know, just as these people that he's encountered having a hard time believing who Jesus is and, and like you said, what separates us from, from the other religions people is about Jesus. So how is it that we have to be a representative, be able to, to speak the same message that Jesus is saying to who he is. And some people, like these people, just can't believe. So, so if I'm understanding your analogy, I'm like we see later, they are followers, but they may not be true believers. They, they may not they may not truly believe everything they've read, everything they've heard, or everything that they've experienced. Now, these people had some powerful experiences. I mean, to see what he did, being part of that 5,000 being fed, to, to now get a revelation that they probably understand, he walked over here. 
You know, we done seen what he's done. And, 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 and I, I submit to you that there are going to be people who come to church that read this word, study this word, hear this word, shout, jump, shout, jump dance, and all that. And then when they walk out here, they ain't going to believe that they heard. Because this belief system got to turn into some action. We have to act on what we believe. Our belief is more than just a mental ascent where we get knowledge. That knowledge got to require us to take some action. The pastor said, I mean, he said, uh, but you haven't believed in me even though you have seen me. Man, if I see Jesus and then performing miracles, you don't have to have faith. You, you, saw, you saw him performing miracles and you still don't believe? You, yeah. you, you still don't believe that? <laughs> well, obviously, uh, Major, you know, they didn't get it, man. Can, can. Because they probably, go ahead, Brother Herb. Well, I, I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit because, you know, the spirit, a revelation to me, came to me. I just wanted to share it. And the question is, when did the disciples got saved? I know. Because, you know, reading and some of the Gospels, and I go, the question was, to me, the question was, when did they got saved? And I go, and through the reading, and I go, wow, yeah, that's a good question. Because right now, John's not saved. I mean, at this point, as he's walking with, with with, with, with Jesus right now at this point. Is he saved right now? No. At this point in time, he's not saved. So for me, don't believe that he's saved. Now, uh, what, what, what you base that on? Base well, that on? Uh-huh. That, that he's not saved, you know. If he's been walking with it, he believes in Jesus. If he, what, what if I, he been okay. accepted Jesus, I'm just asking. Okay. If he met the I'm, criteria. I'm, okay, he, my, my thing is, is that what, what came to me when, when Jesus was captured when 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 Jesus was getting it at the at the garden all the disciples ran for their life well if you running you run away from him they're running from their life they didn't stand and to to say who Jesus is Peter denied Jesus three times, saying, I don't know him. No, you got it wrong. And then the revelation came to me is, when Jesus rose. Wait, wait, let me stop, let me stop. Because you use an analogy of what Peter did, that was out of fear he lied. I mean, I, I, mean, yes. I, I, don't, I don't think that had nothing to do with his salvation. Christians still lie. I mean, people been in church for years. Sang, dance in the choir, preach in the pulpit, and still. Yeah, but, so, but, so, so but, the thing but, is. But at the same time, just, he still, he lied three times. But at the same time, they was hiding from, they were still fearful. That's right. They were still fearful. They was hiding because they was fear that, once again, that they was fear of a man going to come and get them. Come and get them. Let me finish my story. I just don't want you to tie your story to salvation. Because this, this scripture here is not necessarily talking about his yeah, disciples' yeah, yeah. salvation. So to a point where, when I'm trying to get to a point where, Pastor, is that when Jesus came and rose, he came where the disciples at. And when, they came, when, he came where, when he came where the disciples at, they said, oh my goodness, you are. You are. You said that you what you're going to do, that you was going to be risen. And they, and that word here, right there, to me is that when they believe who Jesus really was, because they saw him, just just like when James said, "I ain't going to believe who he is until I touch him." And so, what I'm trying to say is just the fact that that that's when they got saved and really believed who Jesus really was. Okay. That's, to me, 
And, and I I'm, mean, glad, the, I'm glad you carry that you by saying to you, and I can't stop what you believe. Okay. That's okay. Well, okay. Uh, then, but, but let, me, let me read on her. Let me read on, because okay. I think that we, we answer our question. He said, now look, he says, verse 37, he says, however, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never reject them. So I believe if Jesus believed that the Father gave him Peter, John, and James, he ain't going to reject them. They may err, they may fall, to, fall apart, because later on he's going to say, man, I got these 12, and one of them is the devil. Because he knew. And the reason I'm going to classify the devil because he betrayed him and sold him out for money. Now, but what we see here, he says that when the Father give me something, like what he said, you're going to say later in John 10, what the Father has put into my hand, no man can snatch out. Now, it don't mean that Herb can't jump out, but he said, no man has the ability to take Herb out of my hand. Herb can take himself out, but can't nobody else do it. And see, this gets to a point here, Major, when you read some of this, it looked like from God's point of view, he kind of already know how some things going to play out, and we don't. So here he's saying, so whether they believed him, him, you know, believed in Jesus or not, was he saying that, I don't care whether you believe, I'm not going to reject you? Is that? No. He said when the Father, the Father, the, when the Father give him someone, God is going to work with us to get us to that point where we believe. Because he said what you got to do is you got to believe. So God ain't going to violate that. But there are going to be different things that can be presented to us that will allow us to believe. The word being taught to us, right. the, us understanding and, and the spirit ministered to us. And all those things is designed by God for us to re realize who Jesus is. And so that's why he could say when we do that in his mind, the father is orchestrating that. Right. The father is at work by his spirit, making some things happen. Okay? He says, in verse 38, he says, For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. So he's saying, look, I, again, he's going back to keep making this point. I, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in agreement. I walk in oneness with God. I'm not going to do anything that he don't want me to do. And so therefore, when I'm in the earth, I'm representing him. And we said at the beginning of John, if you understand Jesus, you understand God. He said, now look, and this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those who, who those he has given me, but that I will raise them up at the last day. It's God's will that everybody that come to him through Jesus, get saved. And that Jesus said, I don't want to lose nobody. And then when I come back at the last day, everybody who believed, not by their works, but who believed and, 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 and in me, then now on the last day, they're going to all be raised when I come back. Those he, the believe here, yeah, it's somebody said, those, those who have accepted him through salvation, those who accepted God's plan, he said that when I come back, I promised them salvation. Now, I, I'm not finna get into that debate because there are some people being pro, you can lose your salvation. Some say you, once you get saved, you're saved forever. And that's just a matter of which side of that coin you want to be on because you can find a scripture in the Bible that su support either side of the argument. I can only say for Larry Bolton, I believe once I'm saved, I'm always saved. I ain't going to hell. You know, I, I just don't believe it. But now some people may feel like, hey, I can go out there and, you know, the Lord get mad at me for one off and, and all of a sudden now he's going to snatch my salvation card. I, I think the Jesus' blood kind of got all that covered. Yes, ma'am, again. I, I was so intrigued by what you were saying about the, the, the he's able to, to keep us in it. I mean, can't no one pluck us out of his hand. And, um, but when I, I it, it brought back to my remembrance when I first became a Christian and 
and the Lord would bless me, and I had so much favor, and I was getting so many things, and I was having all these, uh, uh, what, 19, 20-year-old riding around in a new Cadillac, and, and, and God gave me all these things to get my attention when I, like, I became a follower. And then all of a sudden, I heard a teaching like this, and then it reminded me, am I following him for those things, or will I pull away if he take them away? And then that's when I began to gird in my spirit and want to pursue him and go after him for his face. And I remember praying to him, Lord, I don't want to follow you just for your hand. I want to seek your face. Show me how to seek your face. Because in my natural mind, I, I didn't know how to seek him. I was a new Christian. I, I was a, a teenager partying. That, that's all I knew. And so as I began to ask him to show me how to seek his face, he, he presented things to me, trials and tribulations and things that made me want to want to seek him. But then I got that relationship with him to the point of when even if I'm laying in my bed at night and I'm lonely, I feel like, and I know, not feel, I know I can call on the name of Jesus and the Holy Spirit is there to comfort me. And, 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 uh, and, and that's the way I, I, I see him now. He's like that friend that's closer than a brother, pretty much. And everywhere I go, he's there. But in the beginning, he got my attention with that favor and those things and, and salvation, but I, I had to get that relationship with him. But like with a marriage, I mean, you can get married, but you, every year you get that relationship. Every Amen. year you build that relationship, and that's where we are with Christ, to, to me. As we grow, you know, we get stronger. As we grow, we get a better understanding. And, and, and so look at this. Now, after Jesus talked about you know, he's going to raise them up on the last day. Man, that, that resurrection thing, that gets people from the last day. You know, that's one of those things that, wait a minute, wait, wait, just a minute. Did he, did he just say on the last day, I'm going to raise them up? See, everybody didn't believe in this thing called resurrection, even today. There are people who go to church today, and some of them can't grasp and understand this thing called the resurrection. You know, and so when these people heard this, Look what they say. You know, he talking about he the bread from heaven. You know, the Bible says in verse 41, the people began to murmur in disagreement. Now, they, they, they man, I, I just heard the Savior of the world teaching and talking. And now I'm murmuring and complaining and disagreeing with him. Why? Because he said, I am the bread of life that come down from heaven. Man, that stuck with them. Man, we know this dude. We know his mom and his dad. He talking about he come down from heaven. He live right around the corner. He live on 4th Street. You know, he live on 4th Street. I know his brother and his sister too. And he talking about he come down from Come down from heaven. They weren't ready for that, man. They were not ready for that message. Well, you know, I'm just saying in Larry Bowles' vernacular, but this is how they say it back in their day. They kind of said the same thing. Anyway. They said, isn't this Jesus the son of Joseph? We know his father and mother. How can he say, I come down from heaven? Man, we got a problem with you, Jesus. We watched the boy grow up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we done seen him in the neighborhood running around, man. And now he's talking about he done came down from heaven. Man, when you say something like that, man, we have to accept that by faith. We have to, we didn't see, we didn't even, we're not even privileged to have this conversation. That they had. So we, man, we, we got a, a harder road to go up. These people right there had a hard time. We ain't seen none of it. We just taking it that somebody who wrote this told us the truth. And we got to believe everything he just told them folks about him. That he is the bread of life. Now look at this. But Jesus replied, stop complaining about what I said. He said, now, for no one can come to me unless the Father has sent me to draw them to me. And at the last day, I will raise them. Man, that was a tough one right there. And he said, the Father got to do some drawing. And nobody's going to come unless the Father draws. So that means that God is at work drawing people. We don't know how. I'm believing through his word through us ministering to them, through us sharing this gospel. I'm believing all those are the tools that God used to draw people. 
but we don't have the privilege of knowing who is going to come. Our job is to just try to draw. Now, from God's point of view, he may already know, Mary J ain't coming. But I don't know. My job is to go to witness the major like he is coming so that his blood won't be on my hand. And so it leads me to believe that God is orchestrating, but he is not forcing people to do what he's orchestrated. He is making something available to them, but it's still up to them to accept what is being presented. He says, as it is written in the scriptures, they will be taught by God. Okay. God used people too. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Wow. Then he says, not that anyone has ever seen the Father. So he's saying that, going back to that truth, God is spirit. So none of us has ever seen God. Only I, who was sent from God, have seen him. Now he started, man, he really finna upset him now because he's really talking about his relationship with God and identifying his deity as being God. So he says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, would never die. Again, in a natural way, they probably say, wait a minute, folks still dying. That's what somebody tell you today. Man, such and such died last week. He ate the bread. He was going to church for 40 years. Got saved, baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, dead. And so the Bible is clear. Physically, everybody's going to die. Yeah, but Jesus ain't talking about physical death here. He, he's saying, look, this thing that I'm trying to get you to see is about spiritual death. And so we all agree, we see it every day, dying physically is going to happen. But now he's saying, beyond the grave, there is life. And those who accept me will experience everlasting life when they give up the physical life. And so I can imagine for people who don't believe in a resurrection will have a hard time with that. Man, if you don't believe in a resurrection, wait a minute, he just said something now. That's, that's too deep. That's blowing way over my head. I, I can't believe that. Now he's talking about the bread of life and da-da-da. Talking about what our ancestors ate in the wilderness and they all died. Then tell us that anybody who eats of him ain't, will never die. Look what he says in verse 51 again. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will never die. And this bread which I offer so the world may live in my flesh. I come down in, as, a, as a, you know, a God in the flesh, divine, come down to sacrifice my life for the world. And when the world accepts me, they live through me. We live through Jesus. Our eternal life is connected to what he did, not anything that we've done. Now look at this. Verse 52, and I'm, I think I'm going to stop right here. I think all oh, the next verse or two, let me, real quick. It says, then the people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat, they asked. Again, they thinking in the natural. And because of that, they missing the spiritual truth that he's trying to get them to see. And so Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life with him. Now, again, that is kind of alluding to what we symbolize when we do uh, communion. You can see that connection there. And he's not talking about a physical eating of his body and drink, drinking his blood physical. He was talking about the sacrifice of his body. And what we do is we partake in that sacrifice. We, we remember that sacrifice. And when we accept him, we accept the sacrifice that he made for us. 
He says, but anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is food, is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh remains in me, and I in him. Okay, let me go ahead and read to 59, then I'm done. He says, I live because of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. In other words, our connection, everything that we have when it comes to our eternal salvation and our life is connected to Jesus. I mean, he, he is the one. Look at this. He says, I am the true bread that come down from heaven. Anyone who eat this bread will not die as your ancestor did, even though they ate the manna, but will Anyone who ate uh, uh, will not die, uh, no, will not die as your ancestor did, even though they ate the manna, but will live forever. And look at this. And he said these things while he was teaching in the. Man, he in that monk church. <laughs> I mean, now he got to the synagogue. He said these things. And what, what, what we got to see here is that everybody that come to church don't necessarily believe. Attendance don't always equate to true belief. We come to church, people come for a lot of different reasons, but a lot of times they may not understand the truth of God's word, so therefore they don't live like Jesus has already paid the price for them and that they truly understand that. Brother Fred, I saw your mic. Uh, yes, sir. I've talked to people who've been a church pastor for years, and they still say that can't be all true. Accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior. They say it's got to be more to that. It's just too simple. They feel that, you know, it got to be, I got to do more than just accept him. It got to be more than that to get salvation. Amen. Amen. Again, going back to that mindset of works. You know, it, it can't be that easy. And, and, and again, God didn't, his plan wasn't to make this hard. Because he said he wanted everybody saved. It's his will that everybody be saved. And so he made it easy for us. All we got to do is believe what he did and not think we got to go out and, and outwork somebody to get saved. And so we can see here that this argument goes back and forth. And, and next week, week after next, we pick back up because we'll do this chapter and then we'll probably go right on into the next one. You know, the Bible says now many of his disciples, disciples, mm -hmm. desert him. Not just the people that's following, but now many of his the people who were closer, not maybe the Peter, the Paul, the Je Peter, James, John, that group, but there were others who were considered to be the... And there are people right now in the church today, who we consider to be disciples, and a lot of them are leaving, leaving church. We thought, man, that was a true disciple. I mean, that person loved the Lord. I got their testimony on tape. We done seen them. We done heard them. And all of a sudden, they leaving. <laughs> Something that they just can't accept anymore. And walk away from it. And that's sad. But the consolation for us today is you don't have to take it personal when folk walk away. Because they walked away from Jesus, maybe they're going to walk away from you. So you can't go and beat you. Well, I guess I ain't doing my job. No, they got it. They chose to walk up. Amen. I mean, if the greatest teacher on earth <laughs> could keep them, and we, they saw what he did and still walk away. And now we get so upset because somebody who ain't seen what he did and can't grasp what he did, and they walk away, and all of a sudden we, oh, God. But no, man, look at here. You gave them the word. They didn't want to get in their heart. Their blood is no longer on your. You want everybody. You want everybody to be saved. Want everybody. But some people just going to walk away. That's just a fact of life. Some people are going to walk away. And some people that may be 
very close to you can walk with. People that you know. People that were in the trenches with you all of a sudden were just for whatever reason people will fall away. And the Bible talk about falling away. And so we shouldn't be amazed when people for whatever reason fall away. It should grieve us but it shouldn't put us to a, in a place where we think that the word is no longer the word and it don't have power. Still got power, but the people got to want to accept the truth that they know. Amen? All right, we're going to pick I, that up, Brother May. So, like, say, say if someone walked, does that, does that mean that they didn't believe or they, not, I don't want to say never believe, but does it necessarily mean that, that they don't believe with the gospel because they walk away or it could be other circumstances that drive you to do something else but does that mean that you don't believe it? Yeah I mean you know when you walk away that means something has changed in your belief system. You know whatever that may have been you may have seen something and you no longer can accept that as true and you walk away from it. Apostasy, apostasy when people start falling away from the gospel. Right. They know it but right. people going to fall away. And, you know, James, the one of the later books, said, you know, man, if you done tasted and seen that and, and been that close to it and you walk away, it's going to be hard, almost impossible for you to come back. And that's what some people believe that you can walk away from your salvation. They use that scripture to justify you can lose your salvation, you know. But again, I go back to that's an individual choice, you know, and, and we, we'll, we'll see next time we talk when he talk about... <laughs> You know, you know, the thing that caught me major in this last one is that Fred, Jesus said, I picked them, and one of them is the devil. I mean, I picked one of the guys that close to me. I picked them, and he's got a devil in him. Man, you know, if you, if you, you handpicked, pick Brother Purdue, and halfway through the journey, I found out Brother Purdue got a, got a devil in him. That's, that's, that's tough right there. That's tough. All right, all right. Oh, we don't want overtime. I'm sorry.